Hello everyone, uh, good afternoon, good evening or good morning from the World Health Organization headquarters in Geneva. Uh, my name is Alexandra Kuzmanovic and uh, today I'm joined um, as most of the time, uh, times with uh, Dr. Mike Ryan and Dr. Maria Van Kerkhove. Um, it's our Wednesday time to answer your questions about COVID-19 pandemic, about the response, about the variants, um, epidemiological situation and the measures we can all take to stop transmission from spreading further. Um, if you're watching us on Twitter, please use the hashtag AskWHO to send us your questions. If you're watching us on Facebook, LinkedIn, or YouTube, please send us your questions via comment section. Our team will curate those and send them through. Um, good afternoon, Mike, Maria. Uh, thanks, thanks for your time. Um, as, as usual, maybe we can start with uh, the epidemiological update. Um, a few days ago, Dr. Tedros highlighted that we are seeing global decline, but also that there are some uh, still worrisome places around the world where transmission is increasing. So um, over to you to, to provide us detailed update. I can begin, but uh, Maria will also give some detail, particularly I think, around the situation in, in Africa. I mean, Yes, the numbers have dropped, and, and again, we're, we're seeing that drop again this week with uh, 2.6 million cases, but we still have 72,000 deaths, so we still have over 10,000 deaths a day. So the cases have decreased 12%, but the deaths only 2%. Um, and, you know, we still have to reflect that we now exceed 175 million <coughs> cases uh, worldwide. But Let's, let's celebrate that we're at the lowest level of incident cases since February this year, uh, and that's good. But as uh, you said in your introduction, Alex, that masks uh, a lot of differing trends. And we've seen um, um, challenges in, in, in transmission in South America, in Central America. Obviously, uh, we've seen it in India and in Nepal but also uh, increasingly and worryingly in, in Africa over the last number of weeks. And while the numbers in Africa themselves um, are, 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 are don't represent a massive proportion of the global cases, we know that diagnosis in Africa is not at the same level of intensity. So when you see the shift in trend, uh, the trend is concerning. Um, and when you look at the, the proportion of vaccines in the world that are going to Africa, then that trend is even more concerning. So uh, maybe Maria can uh, give us a little bit more detail on the Africa yeah. situation. Sure. Thanks, uh, Mike. Thanks, Alex, for having us back again. So, you know, as Mike said, the, the situation globally is, is quite diverse. Um, in Africa, in the last seven days, we published our SITREP. As you know, we publish it every Tuesday night. So for the most uh, up-to-date information, look at the SITREP that's posted there and look at our website um, where you can you can look through and, and look at very specific information by region or by country. Um, in the African region, uh, we've had a 44% increase in cases in the last seven days and we've had a 20% increase in deaths. Um, and as Mike said, overall, while the number of reported cases across the African continent, and it's a very diverse conflict, uh, continent with many, many countries with a large number of people, um, uh, we are seeing some increasing trends again. Um, some of these increasing trends we've seen are in South Africa, um, where we're seeing a slight increase. Um, some are saying it's, it's the start of a third peak there. Um, in Zambia, in Uganda, uh, in Namibia, in DRC, um, and, and, you know, these increases in, in 18 months into a pandemic really worry people because, you know, we do have a lot of tools at hand. Um, but we, what we do need, um, not just in Africa, uh, but across the world, but particularly in Africa, is more testing. And we need to have testing available. Um, so uh, there are many tests that are available. There's PCR tests, that, which are done in, in labs. But we also have these rapid antigen-based tests, which are easy to use. Um, they're highly reliable. We have several that have been uh, approved by WHO. Um, they're affordable. They can be used outside of clinical and laboratory settings. They could be used by trained individuals, including community health workers. Um, and they can really give you rapid results back to say, do I have this virus or not? And most importantly, a test is only as good as if it's linked to public health action. Um, so we do need more tests that are available, and we're working with our ACT um, partners uh, to be able, and our WHO partners uh, to be able to procure more and to, to ship those to countries to have them, them used uh, readily. 
Um, but there are some some worrying trends. I mean, we don't reportedly around the world. We don't we don't know how many cases have been reported to date. We assume that we are missing many many cases, and this this we know because of the seroprevalence studies that are ongoing around the world. Um, and our seroprevalence studies, you know, suggest that from natural infection, not including vaccination, you know that. It depends on the population that's under study that for every case we detect, we're missing a certain number of unrecognized cases. And that could be anywhere from five to 100, depending on the setting that, that we're looking at. So we really need good testing to know where is the virus circulating so that we can have the most appropriate tailored public health actions after that. Um, and I don't know if you're going to ask about variants later, but you know we still have these virus variants that are circulating. Um, we have four variants of concern, the alpha, beta, gamma, and delta variant. There's a lot of reports in the news about the delta variant. This is the B1617.2 um, variant that is circulating now in more than 80 countries. Um, more than 80 countries right now have reported this Delta variant. Um, all four of these variants of concern have, have demonstrated increased transmissibility. And that means it has mutations that allow, for example, um, the virus to adhere to the cell and infect the cell more easily in the person. Um, and if, you can, if it can spread more easily, then more people can get infected quickly. And if a system is overwhelmed, and many systems are overwhelmed already, it could overburden the health system and fill beds very quickly. Um, and so we're worried about that because um, we have an exhausted world, an exhausted public, um, and the virus is becoming more fit. So this is something we expect, uh, that the virus to continue to evolve. Um, but this poses a lot of challenges for us. Um, and uh, we need good eyes and ears on where the virus is. We need good sequencing to be able to determine where these variants are circulating um, and so that we can apply the most appropriate measures. Um, our public health and social measures work. Our diagnostics work. Our therapeutics and our vaccines do work. Um, and we do need to continue to use all of those. Variants of concern with increased transmissibility mean that we need to be strict and stringent on our public health and social measures. And in some situations, we may need to apply those for longer. Um, it doesn't mean full lockdown. That's not what I am saying. I'm just saying using a tailored, comprehensive approach and using the tools at hand. Um, and so everybody needs access to these tools, not just some. Um, and so we are working with our partners to ensure people all over the world have access to all of the tools at hand. This also includes uh, vaccines. Thank you so much, Maria. And um, I would just remind once again our viewers that today we, are, we will provide you with the update on variants of concern and some of uh, variants of interest and also public health and social measures. So feel free to ask your questions. Um, Maria, as you already mentioned, variants of concern. And yes, one of the, the questions that we've been seeing on, on our social media channels is um, about the Delta variant. Uh, if you can share any, any latest knowledge that we have about it. But also, we've seen some news reports about Delta Plus variant. So what does it actually mean when people say Delta and Delta Plus? So we are using that phrase Delta Plus. Um, what we have are, we're seeing the Delta variant, this B1617. And remember, this is a constellation of mutations. It's a number of mutations that are identified in this. And we've actually outlined which mutations are there in the spike protein and elsewhere. <clears throat> when I think, and I, I haven't seen the reports of the Delta Plus, um, but what I think this means is that there's an additional mutation that has been identified. Um, and so what we are doing with our virus evolution working group, with clinicians around the world, with epidemiologists around the world, are to look at these specific mutations um, and the combination of mutations and what these mean in terms of transmission, what these mean in terms of uh, severity, and really importantly, what these means in terms of our medical countermeasures, our vaccines, for example. Um, in terms of the Delta variant, we do have demonstrated increased transmissibility. Um, there are several studies that are underway that have shown this, and it's even more transmissible than the Alpha variant. Um, and so, you know, any increase in transmissibility makes control measures that much harder. We have seen some reports about increased severity in the, in the Delta variant. Um, those studies do need to be confirmed. Um, they need to be replicated. We need more information to determine, is it really the variant itself? Or is it a combination of factors? You know, like I mentioned, because there's increased transmissibility, um, this may burden the healthcare system and may mean there aren't enough beds or there isn't enough uh, 
time to be able to give clinical care or people are entering the clinical care pathway longer. So there's a lot to disentangle there. I don't want to, you know, break it down to just one factor because it's never just one factor. So we are looking at all of these mutations. Um, and in some of the Delta variant, we've seen the Delta variant with one uh, less mutation or one deletion instead of an additional, we've seen a deletion. So we're looking at all of it. Um, and we're tracking alerts, we're tracking variants of interest, and we're tracking variants of concern. So I think to date our teams have looked at more than 50 different variants and assessed more than 50 different variants based on available information that we have. And what we do is we update our website um, with the tables and we include detailed information on each of these variants of interest as well as variants of concern in the SITREP. Um, we have a new variant of interest um, that we reported yesterday. Um, it's the Lambda variant of interest, um, and it's the C37, um, if you use the Pango nomenclature, for those of you who follow that. Um, this is, this is a, a variant that we've been tracking for some time, um, and it has some mutations in the spike protein. I won't list them, but there's several. Um, and those have some suspected uh, uh, impacts on, on the virus itself in terms of transmissibility. It needs to be studied. This is why this is a variant of interest. Um, this variant is circulating in a number of South American countries right now. Again, the detail is in our EPI uh, report, but uh, there's been elevated prevalence detected in Chile, in Peru, in Ecuador, in Argentina. But again, I mention the countries, and I almost hesitate to mention the countries because my concern in doing so is that there's a stigma attached to this. Countries are doing an incredible job of surveillance and reporting, and we need that to continue. And we need all of your help in not applying a stigma to this, because it's important that we understand what is circulating and what it means, because all of us have exactly the same goal of ending this pandemic. So please, you know, I need your help. Um, and if there are also any journalists that are out there too to help us, you know, celebrate the reporting of this and how important this is and how impactful this can be on the work that Mike and I in the teams and our country teams do um, because this really helps us bring get us that much closer to ending this pandemic. Thank you, Maria. I just have a follow-up question maybe because you were talking about variants of concern, variants of interest. Um, what, how do variants of interest become variants of concern? Is there any criteria? And also, are there some variants that are not variants of interest, mm -hmm. or all variants that we identify are variants of interest? Well, that's an interesting question. I would say, if I were talking to my family or my son, I would say all of these variants are of interest, which means we need to study them, which is why we you know, have established this global monitoring and assessment framework, and we're working with partners all over the world um, to be able to track these and assess these. But we have three sort of levels. We've got these alerts that we call, which are variants that are being reported. We're working with the GISAID group, and we're working with Next Strain, and working with the Pango group, and our Virus Evolution Working Group to track what are the viruses that are being detected and the sequences that are being shared, and what does this tell us about the evolution of the SARS-CoV-2 virus? So there are alerts that we're tracking. Um, they become a variant of interest if they have some mutations that may um, change the behavior of the virus or have these phenotypic changes of the virus, meaning they may have some increased transmissibility. And if we start to see some circulation of these viruses in countries, then we'll say these are a variant of interest. I'm oversimplifying. Um, we have some definitions that we have clearly outlined, and when they meet that definition, it's a low bar for a variant of interest. But for a variant of concern, we have demonstrated changes. Um, in terms of transmission, in terms of severity, or any impact on our diagnostics, therapeutics, and vaccines. And we have a virus evolution working group that we established a year ago um, that helps us in making this assessment. And that's made up of experts around the world um, with different backgrounds that help us go through the, the detail of each of the studies. And we, we try to absorb every piece of information we can to make those characterizations. We will have a further group um, that will look at vaccine composition. And if these variants um, demonstrate reduced efficacy of our vaccines enough that the vaccines need to be modified, then this group will help us make that composition. We do something very similar for influenza. Um, I'm talking a lot here. I don't know. Mike, you want to come in? Here? No, I'm, I'm, I'm getting an easy ride today. It's good. I'm, not, it's I'm, good. I'm, I'm talking a lot. I, I, just, I, I think I'm... 
I'm maybe, you know, explaining a lot because I do want viewers to know that there are a lot of people that are looking at this every single day. We have meetings on this with people around the world every day because it is of such a concern. Sorry to use interest and concern in a, in a different way, but we take all of this extremely seriously because working so hard to control COVID, we don't want to be in a situation where the virus changes enough that we have to, you know, we, we go back to, to square one. This is why you know, we need to prevent as many infections as we can right now and continue to do so. Because the more the virus circulates, the more opportunities it has to change. And we cannot you know, get into a situation where our countermeasures don't work. Thank you, Maria. Mike, maybe you can take a question that we've got from Finn May, who is watching us on Facebook. What is the best practice for detecting and preventing the wider spread of new variants? Um. That's a smart question uh, because that's what we really need to get into. I think what we need to, I think, understand is that we want to stop the spread of all the variants because the variant that started this whole thing was a variant of something else that came before. Uh, so this disease emerged uh, in, in nature. Uh, it changed and when humans were infected, that disease could spread between humans. And that's exactly what viruses do. They change and adapt. Um, and in a sense, uh, you've, there's two ways in which these viruses change and adapt. And for those of you out there who are uh, programmers will know that you can, you can make a coding error when you, uh, when you write a program. Uh, that can result in your program no longer working. It can result in no change to the behavior of your program. Or it can maybe on occasion result in something remarkable. It works better. And that's all the viruses are doing. They make coding errors, mm -hmm. and some of those errors are an advantage, and some are a disadvantage. And it's not that each virus <laughs> is adapting, it's that you have billions of viruses uh, in hundreds of thousands of people. So with all of those little coding errors, every now and again, one of those errors, or two of those errors, or a combination of those errors, just by chance, give the virus, and that changes, as Maria said, the genotype, basically the code. What matters is the phenotype, what happens when that virus is in the real world. Does it change the transmissibility? Does it change how severe the disease is? Does it change uh, how the virus behaves in the real world? And if an advantage is conferred, then that virus tends to replace all the other viruses because it's better and what we call fitter. That's mm -hmm. the, I know that's used in a different way in, in youth culture, uh, but uh, that's how virologists uh, and we call that. And it's the fitness of the virus. And what we mean by the fitness of the virus is how adapted is the virus to infecting and transmitting between humans or making them sick or causing their death? Um, and it's chance process. Uh, it's not in the, the, the virus is not trying to kill us. The virus is, is not, uh, it doesn't have a brain. Uh, most of the time what viruses will end up doing is settling down into a pattern of transmission that, that it can continue to transmit over a long period of time. Um, but we're not, we're not there with that, with that virus. So from, from the perspective of stopping variants, it's, it's the same as stopping transmission. The more human beings that are infected, it's the lottery. You buy a lottery ticket, uh, and if we have hundreds of thousands of human beings infected with millions and billions of individual viruses, we increase the chance of that coding error. Or sometimes, it's not just a coding error, sometimes if an individual is infected with two different types of the virus, they can exchange code, not just one error, but they can actually swap playing cards. They can actually, one virus donates part of its genetic code to the other virus because the two viruses are infecting the same cell at the same time. And that's called recombination. So the virus can change through mutation or through recombination. And uh, uh, either of those processes can lead to uh, a different virus emerging. Uh, the best way for us to stop that is to stop transmission in general. And that's why we keep saying we've got to suppress transmission of the virus. The fewer people that are infected, the less chance the virus has of mutating or recombining. And, more, and secondly, the more we protect individuals with vaccine, the less opportunity we give for people to be infected. Um, it, I know it would be nice to have a, a more sophisticated answer, but if we stop transmission, the virus stops. Uh, if transmission continues, the virus not only continues to transmit and, inf and infect at its current capacity or fitness, but it may get even fitter uh, and become even more lethal or more transmissible. So you're, there's a double whammy here. Yeah. 
continuing to let it transmit, and it doesn't matter which variant we're talking about, it will kill people. But continuing to let it transmit also raises the, uh, raises the stakes in this poker game. Uh, because what it means is the virus also has a chance to adapt and evolve and become even more lethal. And that's why it's so important we keep transmission suppressed. Thank you very much, Mike. Um, there's several questions around variants that you are still getting from, from viewers. Thank you for that. Um, this is a question coming both from Facebook and LinkedIn viewers. How effective are currently available vaccines against the Delta variant? Um, and so there's a lot of studies that are currently underway. So uh, we don't have a complete picture of that yet. What we do know is that the, the vaccines work against severe disease and death. They are effective against preventing severe disease and death. And so this is why we need, when it's your turn, to get vaccinated and make sure that you follow up with that second dose. This is really important because you don't get the full immunity when you, when you have the one dose and any variants that may have reduced neutralization or may um, have the, the vaccines work less effectively, even though they still work, you need that second dose um, to make sure that you're fully, that you receive that full amount of protection. Um, and so there's a lot of studies underway. I don't have the details in front of me on the different vaccines and I'm not, that is not my expertise and so I'm not gonna speak to that, but viewers out there need to know that these vaccines work against the Delta variant. Um, and it is important to get vaccinated when it is your turn. And it is important to go to, for that second shot. If your um, regimen says to get that second shot, make sure that window in between is um, respected and that you follow up on that. But again, um, you know, we are looking at this. Um, there are some studies that suggest some, some slight reduced neutralization. Um, but when your body develops an immune response, from natural infection, there's a certain antibody level that you receive, and it's different when you get a vaccine. You know, you can have a very strong, robust response from vaccine, and especially that second dose. And that's why we say it's still effective against severe disease and death. When we started this uh, whole process, and, and a shout out to all those scientists around the world who worked on this uh, in, the, in the public and in the private sector, you know, I remember when we were looking at the target product profiles mm -hmm. for what vaccine we would want, what would we accept, what would we hope for? Because we didn't have a vaccine against coronavirus anywhere in the world being used, right? And we were, new platforms were being proposed uh, uh, as well, and so we were dealing with uh, both innovation and in terms of developing a vaccine against a new disease, but also having to deploy new science and new platforms for their manufacture and their testing. And I remember at the time we were when we talked with all the scientists, we kind of put those boundaries as, you know, if we got a vaccine that was 50% effective with a lower bound of confidence of 30%, we'd probably use that vaccine given how lethal the virus was. So now we're talking about vaccines that are 98 and 96% effective and are still 90 to 100% effective against serious illness and death. Mm -hmm. They may, because of the variants, uh, not be quite as efficient at preventing transmission but they are definitely preventing severe illness, hospitalization, and death. And if you had asked me a year and a half ago, would I want a vaccine like that? That's the vaccine we would have, we would have wanted. So these are still superb products. They're safe, they're effective, they will stop people going to hospital, they will stop people dying. Um, and we will continue to evolve those vaccines with our partners to ensure that we will adapt and update. And many studies are going on looking at uh, uh, second generation vaccines, looking at boosters, and all that work is happening. So to everyone out there, that work is happening. The problem we have right now, uh, right now, is these vaccines work, but they're, they're not in the right places. And we talk about uh, so few people, we talked about Africa and our concerns in Africa. It's the, the, it's the lowest number of vaccines in the world are currently in Africa. So there are still people who are highly vulnerable by, by, by their age or by underlying conditions or their exposure as health workers. They are still not being vaccinated. And I think for me, uh, those people in, 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 in developed countries who are getting vaccinated, get your vaccine if you're offered. If you're in line, get your vaccine. But also, we need collectively, us as global citizens, we need to also put pressure on the system wherever we can to ensure that these vaccines are also shared with those vulnerable uh, groups all around the world and we need to have that done now mm -hmm. because we can talk about variants for the future but the variants we have now the standard bog standard 
old coronavirus, right, COVID, SARS-CoV-2, in its original form, is still well able to infect people, it's still well able to kill people, and all of those variants in between. Uh, and vaccines will stop that. So um, I know I'm making a secondary point, Alex, but I think it's important that we continue to make that, that so few people uh, in uh, low-income countries uh, are, are still vaccinated. I mean, I'll give you, I think the, the numbers are, if you live in a high-income country, for every 100 people in that country, 62, 63 vaccines have been delivered. If you live in a low-income country, for the same 100 people, you know how many vaccines have been delivered? One. That's the reality. Yeah. That is the brutal reality. And there are people dying today who should not have to die because they haven't been protected with vaccine. They have vulnerable because of underlying conditions. They're vulnerable because of their age. And uh, uh, these vaccines are, and, and we shouldn't be, as I said, turning our noses up at vaccines, worried about their fact that they are effective, they work. And I just wish we had more of them in the right place. That's my concern today. I'm not concerned about the vaccines, uh, whether they work or not. I'm concerned that we don't have enough of those wonderful vaccines in the right places protecting the right people. Can I come in on that too? Because I want to talk about the, 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 the severe the people who are dying. So between 10 and 11,000 people are dying every single day from COVID-19. And I know in a lot of countries around the world who have high vaccination rates, for many people, this pandemic is over. And essentially, it, it feels over. It is far from over because we all remain susceptible and vulnerable um, to these variants, to, to, the, to the change that we see. And this is what really worries me. This is what keeps me up at night, is the change and the challenges that we face going forward. There was a study that came out in Africa. The DG referred to it in his speech uh, on Monday, um, which came out uh, with this great group. It was published in The Lancet, and it was a study of in 10 different countries across Africa, almost 7,000 hospitalized patients. And it was looking at the mortality rate among these individuals and what were the risk factors for severe disease, for ICU admission, and for death. And what they found, um, and this is consistent across a lot of other countries, age. Age is a risk factor for death. We knew this from the beginning. Um, underlying conditions like chronic liver uh, disease, chronic kidney disease, diabetes. And this also mentioned HIV AIDS as a risk factor for severe disease and death. And we are seeing that it's the insufficient um, access to critical resources, vaccines being one, hospital beds, oxygen, not just oxygen tanks, but all of the other equipment that actually allows that oxygen, medical level oxygen, to be administered to a sick individual. Dexamethasone, uh, you know, to be able to reach uh, critical and severe patients. Um, people are dying um, unnecessarily because we have these tools at hand. We're just not using them and they're not in the right hands around the world. Um, and I think all of us need to reflect on that. So in many countries, you know, about where you live, if you, if it, if you are in one of the fortunate places around the world where you have received your two doses, you know, where your societies are opening up, what can you do? How can you help as well? Uh, because this is far from over. And the two track pandemic that the DG mentioned, I mean, it's just, it's becoming more and more divided. Um, and I struggle with this every day because I, I get mad. I'm mad. I'm frustrated. But we turn that into something productive. And we work with our partners to ensure that these are being delivered. COVAX, you know, having these vaccines donated now. And we're so grateful for the donations that have come from countries all over the world and the latest ones from the G7. But we need those now because people are dying right now. And they're dying unnecessarily. So we have tools at hand to get people into that clinical care pathway, to get assessed sooner, to train, protect, and keep our health workers safe. But you know, it's beyond, it's the, it's walk the talk, you know. Um, we need to really make sure that this is delivered and that it's delivered now, not next year. We'll probably still need it next year, but it needs to be delivered now. And we cannot emphasize, we cannot emphasize that enough. Thank you both. And I, I just, just, just to figure please. Because I mean, we were, you know, not celebrating, but saying, oh, the numbers are down this week and we're down to 72,000 cases. Um, we usually do this call or this discussion for an hour and while we've been discussing this if you take those numbers which are the lowest numbers since february the lowest numbers in months mm -hmm. and it's still 430 people dying while we're having this conversation that we know about that we know about yeah 
uh, and I think that's uh, where we really do have to take care. We also have to keep the focus on decreasing exposure. Mm. At the end of the day, if you don't get exposed to this virus, you don't die from it. And with the situation we have of vaccines right now, many countries do not have vaccines as an option to reduce the risk to their population. Decreasing exposure that people suffer, uh, and that means helping communities to be able to do that. It's tough, it's not easy in terms of overcrowded situations and people have to go to work and they can't stay home and they can't isolate and self-isolate. But governments need to do everything possible to reduce that social mobility and mixing that's going on and those events that accelerate that transmission in communities. And as Maria said, we also then need to help countries who are struggling to provide adequate care to people who are sick. Because people are also dying because they don't have access to oxygen or they don't have access to a healthcare worker or they don't have access to dexamethasone. So if you put the three together, we need to decrease exposure, we need to increase access to good quality medical care, and we need to increase access to vaccination. It's the three things. Mm -hmm. and, and, and we need to understand that right now the vaccine situation is not good enough and we need to keep shouting about it. But for many countries right now, decreasing exposure and increasing access to quality clinical care is what we need to be doing right now uh, while we're driving to get vaccination rates increased. Thank you. I just want to uh, pass one question from our LinkedIn viewer. How do we integrate vaccines and medications to resolve these COVID variants? So um, I, I think you partly already answered that question that we need to um, increase access to different tools, not only vaccines, but to also ensure quality care for people when they, when they need it. Yes, and again, it comes back. It's very hard to fix systems that have been broken for years. Mm -hmm. uh, we do this all the time when we respond to other epidemics, be it cholera, or be it Ebola, or meningitis, or measles. We often go and help and assist in the emergency response. But what upsets me the most is that very often we're going to work within health systems that are already struggling to deliver basic primary health care, already struggling to deliver universal health coverage. And what we're increasingly seeing is that health systems that are already weakened by a lack of investment over years, societies in which there's already deep social inequity, deep inequity in systems, that you're coming in then trying to shore those systems up for long enough to deal with the crisis. That's possible in many situations because the crisis is localized and then everyone can come to help. So it's like going to help your neighbor whose house is burning. <laughs> All the houses may be a fire risk, uh, but your neighbor's house is burning, you go to help. But what happens when all the houses are burning? Mm -hmm. Who comes to help? And that's our problem right now. All the houses are burning and we are not in a position to give enough assistance. And even down to, I mean, I'll say it quite plainly, even down to funding, our funding this year is, is a fraction of what we were able to achieve last year to help our member states. So there is a real issue in, in finding the resources and the money to help countries, finding the vaccines to help countries. Uh, it's, it's not an insignificant problem. And, and we're not going to fix it. Uh, we know what we need to do, as, 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 as uh, Maria says. We have the tools uh, and we have the knowledge to be able to transform the situation. But then when we do, and I hope we will, and I have hope that we will do that, we need to take a really hard look at our health systems and how fair or unfair they are. Because right now, this pandemic has only exposed all of those uh, inequalities and all of the unfairness of our system. We see it now with the unfairness around vaccines. But if you're living, if you're a, someone who's in an ethnic minority living in a country who's, uh, who, who, who's struggling in normal times to, to, to get access to health care, uh, or if you're in a social class or a social group or you're unemployed or whatever it is in your country, there are already huge barriers, already huge barriers. Uh, now vaccine has become yet the latest barrier, but it's a barrier to all people in those situations. But it's not the only barrier, and we're not going to fix things for the long term unless we take a fundamental look at how, I, I would call it health justice, because we don't have any right now. We have serious injustice in the way health is delivered, the way health is protected, uh, and yes, we will do everything in our power with our partners to redress that injustice, but it won't fix the underlying societal issues that we have and how we prioritize health. Thank you very much, Mike. And um, here's a question from Jessica Elizabeth, watching us on Facebook as you were talking about vaccines not being in the right place. So she's asking, how can we, as global citizens, help countries get vaccines that they need? Talk to your representatives. 
write a letter, pick up the phone, write an email, get on Twitter, do what you do. You're more powerful than you think. That's what I would say to citizens. You're way more powerful than you can imagine. Uh, we, we need to work together on this. And, and citizens need to give permission to their political leaders to do this. Because, honestly, if you're a political leader in a country, well, you're trying to serve your own people. And you think you're doing the right thing, because I want to get everyone here vaccinated. Yes, I'll help everyone later, but I want to help my own people first, and then we'll help. You know, put your own mask on before helping others, you know, the, on the airplane, right? And people have got that mentality. So we're going to get our own mask on, and then we're going to help our neighbours. And that's great. I, I don't, I, I don't uh, for me, that's a rational position. But the situation is different because the risks now have are exponentially higher uh, now that we've covered most of the vulnerable people in the developed world. The real danger and risk is now in many developing countries that don't have access to vaccines. Uh, and if you can reach out and give permission to political leaders to say, please share, it's okay. You know, we have uh, enough. Um, uh, and now it's okay for us to be able to give more. It's not give it all away. We're talking about just giving enough. We, we, we need 100 million doses of vaccine in the next two months. And then we need, I think, 250 million by 200, September. 225 in yeah. Africa alone yeah. by September. Yeah. 225 million, excuse me. Yeah. yeah. And uh, if we can reach that first target and that second target, and then we have a third, we can, we can, we can accelerate this. But we need vaccines now. Uh, so you know, use your power. Uh, you've got voices and uh, use them. And it's the collective voice, right? So your individual voice at every age that you are, whatever age that you are, if there's enough, if there's a collective voice in this, there becomes a movement. And that's what we need. I mean, right now, I feel like we're running a sprint marathon every single day. Like it hasn't let up. And I don't see any let up in the future. I keep thinking that, you know, it's going to get a little bit easier every single day. And in fact, it's getting harder because people are exhausted. But we need a movement on this. And it's not charity. This is not charity. This is in your collective interest. This is, this is smart epidemiologically. It's smart scientifically. It's smart morally. It's smart ethically. It's the right thing to do. And economically. It's the right, did I not say economically? It's the right thing economically as well. I mean, it's the right thing to do. This is what will help us end this pandemic. This is what will get us back to, you know, what this normal life we had before, which I hope is a better normal life going forward. But we need the solidarity from everyone around the world. Um, even in the attitude that we have where we are, it's not over. And so if there is something that you can do and you can write to your representative, you can write to your leaders, you can have a collective voice, please do so. You can also donate. So we have the Go Give One campaign where you can donate um, some money that goes towards vaccines. You could donate to you know, organizations that are delivering those vaccines, that are supporting countries and delivering those vaccines. Um, there's a lot that everybody can do. Um, and you, know, you, can, you can make sure that you are part of this collective goal that we have. We need everyone. You've heard me say a lot, you know, play your part. This is also your part in ending this pandemic. Mm -hmm. And I said at the... Um I may have said this at the press conference, I think I did, but just for a comparison for you, um, I think uh, uh, COVAX is looking for $16 billion to bridge this financial gap for vaccinating all of these target populations. Um, when we look at uh, global defense budgets, uh, it's nearly $2 trillion, and that's $2,000 billion, and that's $2,000 million million dollars I, I i i find when we use these trillions and billions you, you don't get a, an idea of how big it is but uh, the money that's needed is less than one percent of the global defense budget for a single year less than one percent now what are we defending ourselves against this is an existential crisis this is a crisis for the world we're being attacked collectively all of us by a virus for which we have the capacity to save lives. And this is going to cost less than 1% of the, just the defense budget globally for a single year. That's what really uh, irritates me. It really it drives me absolutely insane to think that you can, that we, we can't get our heads around that. Mm -hmm. And that's where I think, uh, and, and again, I want to make it clear, there are many brave politicians out there too, and they're, they're, everyone is trying to do the right thing here. Everyone is trying 
to, to, and there have been politicians who have taken strong leadership roles in trying to deal with the issues of vaccine production and invested in vaccines up front and vaccine equity. The difficulty is that for most political leaders, they have to deal with the domestic and the international pressures. And there are strong domestic pressures to keep vaccines. Strong domestic pressures to keep vaccines. And why is that? Because people perceive their citizens want them to keep a hold of the vaccines. So citizens, citizens can turn that around and say, enough already, you've got to share. And I think there is that process where, uh, because I think the, the danger here is we cast the villains and the heroes. There are no villains and heroes in this. There's just one really lethal virus and there's us. And we all play different roles, scientist role, politician role, citizens role, community activist role. So the real question is, can we come together and find a solution collectively? Uh, and there's been way too much ideology in, in this pandemic, way too much politics, way too much siding. You're on this side, you're on that side, you're for or you're against. And that's not helped us. And there is a moment now, a moment to decide, to decide to share. Uh, and not all the vaccines, but just enough to save the lives we need to save for now. And that's why we need, that you, Tedros has said it many times, we thank those countries for the donations they're making. We thank those countries for the investments they're making in, in COVAX and the ACT Accelerator in WHO. But what we need right now is vaccines now. Thank you, Mike, and um, I think, and Maria, of course, um, I would like to pass uh, the question that we've got at the beginning of the conversation. Actually, as soon as we started, this, this question popped up from our viewer, Hari Sankar. Um, I thought to keep it for the end, but I think it's a good follow-up to what you were just saying. How long will it take to regain and go back to our old normal days? I mean, that's the trillion dollar question right now. You know, it's up to us. Um, every decision that we make every single day either will get us closer towards that goal or it will move us further away. Um, and, you know, DG has said many times no one is safe until everyone is safe. And it's true. We remain vulnerable until everyone is protected and we have the power to do so. Um, there are enough vaccines. If we had even used the vaccines to date differently, we would be in a very different position. Our decisions have consequences, good and bad. And so collectively, we need to be you know, playing the part that we can. Um, there is no magic ball in terms of when we go back to normal. And again, you've heard us say lots of times, we hope that new normal is actually better than what we were because that normal wasn't working for a lot of different aspects to this and the inequalities that we've seen in which this pandemic has just exacerbated. Um, and continues to do so now. Um, we, I could give you dates, I could give you stages, I could give you predictions. All I know is any prediction I will give you will be wrong. We see countries right now that are back to quote unquote normal. We see stadiums full. We see people out at cafes. Um, and, you know, collectively, uh, we've got a long way to go. But we could reduce that time if we do the right thing, and if we do the right thing now, and if we do the right thing every day. What I, I, I need to wrap my head around is, you know, the effort that is needed to be able to reduce that time frame and the goal that we all have. Do we all have the same goal of ending this pandemic globally? Um, I'd like to think the answer to that is yes, and I know we are working towards that. And as Mike said, you know, there are incredible people that are out there that are working, risking their lives every single day for this pandemic. Um, and to end this pandemic, and we're grateful for that. Um, but it is up to us. We don't go back to the old normal. Yeah. The normal where you know, kids aren't vaccinated for childhood diseases. The normal where women have to give birth in unsafe conditions. The normal where refugees and others uh, don't have access to health services. The normal where people are impoverished by their health expenses uh, in systems that are deeply unfair. That's a normal I don't want to go back to. I'd like to go forward to something where we can exploit what's our weakness has been in this pandemic, has been our connectedness. We're connected socially as human beings, and the virus just has exploited that. Um, what we have demonstrated on the science side is that when you put people together, communities together, they come together. I saw we had a fantastic meeting yesterday about, about long COVID, mm -hmm. or the post-COVID condition. And we had clinicians and, 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 and pathologists and patients from all over the world. 
online talking about how we were going to be able to better understand that condition and to see that that passion and that commitment from the people suffering from the condition and the people researching it and to see that exchange and the collaboration and the, the chat box and what was being spoken about and asked it gives me hope because we're dealing with a terrible situation and there's a lot of people may carry the effects of this for a very long time into the future and we cannot forget them we cannot forget them and there's going to be more challenges but what i saw and what i see increasingly is that determination to work together to use the connectedness we have to actually create and disseminate good information to create and disseminate good knowledge to innovate and develop vaccines and drugs to to share information and to share surveillance information and laboratory information so i hope we move forward to a situation where we can actually leverage the power of connectedness not the 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 weaknesses that have been exposed by that uh, in this pandemic and it is a, it, it is an existential moment for for society be it in terms of climate mm. uh, justice or social justice or health justice the fact is that we are living out of balance in in a in a in a biome because we live in this biologic world the biome and we're in that is on a planet uh, that is out of balance and that's the reality we are out of balance in the way we're living, the way we exploit the environment, in the way we treat others, um, and, and that is showing, the cracks are showing. And the cracks are showing politically, the cracks are showing in our health systems, the cracks are showing in, in just our general level of happiness and our general level of contentedness. Uh, I'd like to see a more contented, inclusive uh, world where we address our problems together and we try to bring a little bit more fairness to everything. Uh, I know that sounds very aspirational, but it's moments like this, in the end in all our lives, I think I may have said this here before, we don't really change our, our lives or our behavior very often as individuals until we're confronted with a crisis. That's often, if you ask most people, they say, well, I realized I had to do something about it when this happened. Well, this is a when this happened moment. So when we look back in 60 or 100 years time and our grandkids look back on this, uh, will they go, well, you know what? The world woke up with that pandemic uh, and the world woke up on climate and the world woke up on pandemics and we built a better world we built a world that was more resilient and a little bit fairer and better able to cope uh, and maybe just a little happier thank you mike was that harry was the name harry asked the question the name was i will read it again harry sunker ha oh, so i just wanted to say that that's the right question you know we should be asking that question a lot more is when is this going to end not in the are we there yet kind of question of in the car and i remember mike you you mentioning i think it was shrek you know are we there yet no we're not there yet but in a way of you know what are we going to do to end this pandemic and i get a lot of questions if i do interviews i get questions about you know what would you have changed and how would you have done differently and what would you you know and what are the lessons to learn and all of that needs to be done by everyone everywhere but i think every single day what am I going to do today? You know, what am I going to do in the position that I have, in the fortunate position that I have, with the incredible people that I work with at WHO and around the world? What am I going to do today to get us closer towards ending that goal? And I think everybody can be asking that. But we need to think, I'm not going back. You know, I'm, I'm not going back. Mike, we're not going back. We're going forward. And we need to all think about how we collectively move forward because this is not... Um, I hope it will be the last pandemic we will ever have to deal with, but um, I don't think it will be. And so we need to be much better prepared. But if we do not make those changes now, we're not going to make those changes. Because um, when the trauma is fresh uh, and when it's, when it's this um, profound in our lives, that's when we make those changes in our lives. And that's when leaders and governments and people and families make changes. And I, I, would, I would pose to those who are watching, what changes have you made in your life during the last 18 months? I'm sure that there have been many changes for the better. How are we going to do that collectively as a society to handle all of these threats? This will not be the last pandemic. Um, and there are a lot of other threats that are there. But if we wait you know, to make those changes when it's over, we won't do it. Um, so we need to be making those changes now, and I very much look forward to what that future looks like. Thank you both, and I know we want to look forward, but I need to pass one more question that is looking a little bit backwards, um, and if we have any updates about the vi virus origin study and how this all have started 
to take lessons forward. Yeah, we're, we are um, moving forward on that. We've had a lot of exchanges with our member states. We've had discussions um, at the World Health Assembly and um, we're working uh, to come up with the, the next phase of studies. We already have lots of um, suggestions and stuff that came from the first um, origins study or the first team that went to um, China and to Wuhan. And we'd again like to thank them, both the international team and our Chinese scientific counterparts for the work they did. Uh, I know many people have criticized that work, but that work was, was uh, very well done in very trying and difficult circumstances. And we'd like to honor the work that they have done. But there are further questions, and it was always going to be the case. It was always envisaged that there would be epidemiologic and scientific studies done in collaboration with many partners. So we're moving on to that second phase. Um, and we'll be engaging with our member states over the coming week or two, mm -hmm. uh, really trying to get finalization and get uh, the details agreed on, 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 on those studies. But there are studies that need to be done in, in all of the areas in terms of the, um, the, the human epidemiology, the animal epidemiology, uh, laboratory biosafety, many other aspects. So from WHO's perspective, we, we, uh, we definitely have avenues of investigation that are, that are more likely than others, but uh, all of the hypotheses still remain uh, on the table and we'll be designing and proposing ways forward. But again, uh, I'll say this uh, because it's the case in every situation. WHO is a secretariat. We are a global secretariat of 194 member states. We don't have the power to compel countries to do X or to do Y. We work through cooperation, we work by persuasion, we work by convincing, and we work with all of the member states. What we would hope is that the member states who have particular interest in this uh, origins uh, approach, that those member states will talk to each other mm -hmm. and find ways to create the, should we say, the political conditions in which a scientific study can continue. Because to be frank, it is difficult to continue to do scientific studies if we're operating in an environment that's being politicized or is subject to negotiations and other things and other factors and being, and I'm not saying that's good or it's bad, I'm just saying it's hard to do science when there's uh, that kind of tension in the air. And where we trust, and I believe all parties will try to find a way uh, so we can continue these studies. But again, we, we're not the global police. We do not have the power to compel anyone to participate in anything. And that doesn't matter if you're the Cook Islands or Croatia or Cuba or China or your United States or your France or the European Union. It doesn't matter. We don't have these powers. And there's a misunderstanding out there about that. WHO, in that sense, is 194 member states who operate together under a single constitution. We are like the civil service of that group, uh, and we operate under the rules and under the powers that were given by, uh, by our member states. And we will continue to push and persuade, and we'll continue to, to put the pressure on where we can to get good science done, uh, but we need our member states to support us in that and to provide a platform and an environment in which we can do that. And you said it was looking back, but I think it also is looking forward. You know, I mean, there's the forward motion of, of where we take this next. As Micah said, it's always been envisioned as multiple missions, multiple studies. It's very complex. I mean, if you read the report, you'll see so many different hypotheses and so many different studies that are needed. Um, so it is looking forward. I would like to, to collectively think about how do we do this in, in the right environment, as Mike has said. But we very much uh, look forward to really understanding the origins because there is a massive public health importance of this. Um, and we, as I work in emerging diseases and zoonoses, that's my day job. You know, all of these other disease X's that are out there. SARS-CoV-2 was disease X. There's another one out there. There are several that are out there. It could be an arbovirus. It could be a pox virus. It could be another coronavirus. We have teams that are out there. We're working with FAO and OIE and UNEP to look at animal populations. Um, this, you know, these types of viruses, these types of pathogens, they do this. They, they pass species. And so we need to study this. We need to know what this is so that we could be better prepared for the future. And so let's think about this in going forward, and let's think collectively of how we get this done.
you, Maria, for putting it very well. Uh, looking forward, um, and Mike, also for your answers and for your time today. I would also use the chance to thank our viewers watching from many countries. I'll name a few. Uganda, US, Myanmar, Peru, Dominican Republic, Denmark, Mali, Sweden, Uzbekistan, Burkina Faso, Kenya, Cameroon, South Africa, Brazil, Angola, Saudi Arabia, um, the US, Afghanistan, and, and many others. Uh, thank you for your time, for your questions. Um, stay safe. For any further updates, you can follow our website or to follow our social media channels. Until next week, goodbye.